morning, everyone. Welcome to my, my talk about uh, reactive streams principles applied in ACA streams. Word about myself, uh, and maybe also about this picture. So uh, this is a picture of the uh, botanical garden in Merano, Italy. Any people from Italy by accident? Okay. So I really can recommend a visit to this garden. Um, uh, what does this have to do with the talk? Well, in fact, nothing. It's just my, uh, I like gardens and I like trees, so hence this picture. Okay. So really, really uh, cool. Uh, so my name is Eric Lutz and I'm a consultant trainer at uh, Lightband, joined in, um, in July of this year. And... Um, have about four years of Scala experience uh, prior to that. So we'll talk about uh, reactive streams and about ACA streams. So we talk implicitly about ACA in general, and this is kind of a quick uh, view of some of uh, the, the bigger companies that are using ACA today. So what do we have on the agenda? First of all, we... Uh, talk a bit about reactive streams in general, the story, the, the, the history behind it, and the landscape, and uh, then uh, about the reactive stream proto uh, streams protocol in particular. Then we do a small intro to uh, ACA, and then we skip to the main topic of this talk, I think, which is ACA streams, and we'll do a demo. Um, actually, the demo, which is showing you code, is the main part of the of the talk. It's about normally, if everything goes right, it should be about half an hour, and then if we if time permits, we'll have a Q and A. Now, if we talk about streams, um, it's a very very broad concept, and it's uh, it means different things to different people. So, you have an abundant supply of definitions available. And so for the, for the sake of this talk, um, it's important to, to, to look at what our definition will be today, right? So what we, what we have is that we say that the stream is a controlled flow of data. So it's all about letting the data flow at just the right rate. So classically, you can have a stream and uh, stream processing, and if you don't have this uh, second this uh, property, you run into you know either having to drop messages or having out of memory errors. So a bit about the background of uh, of streaming uh, that led up to finally ACA streams. Uh, so everything started in uh, around uh, 2009 when uh, we had the introduction of react reactive extensions in dot, .NET. Um, let's say four years later, uh, we had uh, the, the reactive programming becoming more adopted on the JVM. And some examples of that were the, or are the play framework where iterities were introduced. Um, it act, actually, iterities solve this problem of uh, controlling the flow at the right rate. Um, you have ACA IO, which, as the name says, uh, is mainly about covering the IO part, reading files, reading from sockets, uh, streams on sockets, etc. And then there is a very nice um, API called RX, RX uh, Java which was developed by uh, Ben Christensen. And uh, so each of them have, have different prop, uh, properties. And they sort of uh, are implement parts of the puzzle that needs to implement the, the, the desired property of flowing at just the right rate. So for example, play treaties have uh, something that is called f uh, pull back, uh, back pressure. And so it basically Tells, can tell a sender or a, um, or a provider of, of data to, to slow down, basically, at the appropriate rate. But it's a quite, uh, to be honest, it's quite a, a difficult API. Then we have ACA IO. So it also implements uh, back pressure using negative acknowledgement. Um, so it does low-level low API. It's used mainly in, in messaging. It's a messaging API. 
And then we have Rx Java, which uh, implements a nice API. So uh, you have a fluent, uh, the fluent way of programming in it. But unfortunately, it doesn't implement back pressure. So if we look at iterities, um, iterities is some, some, some code. Uh, so it was released in 2013. But it's actually a, a, a relatively complicated API that doesn't permit you to easily write applications. Okay? It's not a criticism uh, per se, but it's, it has a steep uh, learning curve. So uh, basically, the play in the ACAD teams started looking at uh, common concepts to come up with something new. So what happened was uh, like a coincidence of, of events. Uh, for example, if uh, any of you have uh, followed the course Principles of Reactive Programming on Coursera, anyone uh, of you did that? So it's a, I can really recommend that course. It's, uh, it covers Rx Scala and, uh, and also Akka. It's very instructive. And uh, so uh, Roland Kuhn and Eric Meyer um, uh, met in preparation for that, for that course, and they started talking about these problems with uh, streaming. Uh, later on, there were meetings with uh, other uh, known people in the industry, like Victor Klein, Ben Christensen, and Mar Marius Eriksson at Twitter headquarters. And uh, so they coined this new term, called uh, reactive non-blocking asynchronous back pressure. Okay, it's a mouthful, but that's, uh, that's basically what they, they started uh, working on. So what, what are the goal of this, uh, of this term? Basically, you want to allow uh, users or developers to, uh, to work asynchronously, okay, to basically apply the principles of reactive programming. You should avoid blocking because it's wasting uh, resources and it cause, can cause all kinds of problems. Uh, sometimes you can't avoid it, okay, but uh, you in general you don't want to block. It needs to be safe and safe in the sense that it should implement back pressure to control the flow from uh, the producer to the subscriber. It's a purely local abstraction and it allows for synchronous implementations should you wish to do so. And by the way, it's also compatible with TCP because, yes, uh, TCP is a streaming protocol that implements uh, back pressure. Okay? So, in 2013, uh, more people stepped in, and um, so a reactive streams expert group was formed with uh, well, well known people uh, in the industry. And uh, Konrad Malavsky, a colleague of mine, implemented the uh, technology compatibility kit uh, for uh, reactive streams. So this also uh, led to the release uh, of the uh, 1.0 specification and five, uh, more than five accompanying implementations. So also there is this uh, enhancement process in Java uh, that is likely to be integrated in the following version of the JDK. Uh, so that contains reactive streams. Now, if you look at the at reactive streams, the specification and the APIs, you would say, well, this is the API. Wow, piece of cake. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's get going. So you have like an on next that gets called uh, when a new data element is available and you have requests, let's say from the subscriber side, that can publish the, uh, basically the desire to send, to get more, more data. So it looks simple, but in fact, it, 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 it's not really, because if you have, um, let's say, two implementations of, uh, of reactive streams that uh, work together, um, you have an async boundary uh, between them, so you have back pressure, and um, you basically have a concurrent protocol that you have to uh, uh, abide to. And so these are actually uh, all the rules that the producer and the subscriber have to follow. 
And that's what makes it complicated. And that's why you don't want to use reactive streams uh, directly. Unless you're going to provide something on top of that and you want to provide high level uh, functionality. <coughs> so, if we look at the goals of reactive streams, it's this avoid unbounded buffering across asynchronous boundaries. Okay, so it's basically implementing the back pressure things. And it, its second goal, important, is to provide interoperability between different uh, implementations, different libraries. So don't use reactive streams directly and use a higher level library such as, for example, ACA streams. Okay, a few words about uh, ACA. So, ACA is a toolkit that um, runs on the JVM, basically. It provides for um, a way to build concurrent applications. So, if you've ever built um, concurrent applications, it means like, for example, in the past, uh, quite a long time ago, uh, well, it's still being applied in the C world uh, or C++ C++ world. You can use libraries like um, the threat libraries, basically, okay, uh, POSIX threats. Uh, if you've ever done that, you will know that it's it's quite complicated. Uh, then Java came along. You you have the concurrency primitives like um, synchronized and, and atop atomic uh, variables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's very complicated. Simple examples. Uh, Trivial examples can be implemented quite easily, but if you start building real applications, it starts getting difficult very soon. So it's highly concurrent, distributed out of the box, so it's not an afterthought, and it provides, um, you can build message driven applications basically using ACA. And ACA has multiple components, of which streams is one. But you can, uh, basically you have actors, that's the basic building block. Uh, you have clustering and remoting, so allowing to communicate between different ACA systems on different nodes. You have cluster sharding for scalability. You have ACA persistence uh, that you can use to implement event sourcing. And there is ACA HTTP, if, so if you know, if you're familiar with uh, Spray, ACA HTTP is actually a new implementation uh, that it achieves the same uh, effect. Um, and uh, also very important to point out is that the ACA APIs are available both in Java and in, and in Scala. And then there's something around the corner which is ACA typed, uh, which is still experimental, but it's uh, expected to be released uh, in, as a production version uh, quite soon. So if we look at the actor model, so an actor model is a model of concurrent uh, computation where you have actors as the universal primitive of concurrent computation. So this is a, a, few, a few of the ideas uh, behind it. So you have an actor and basically you have messages that are sent to the actor. Um, and the actor can act on this message by either uh, sending another message to some other actor or changing its internal state, which is un unaccessible from the outside uh, in a direct way. So it can change its internal state and it can change also its behavior. So it can change the way it will in uh, react to, to future messages on the fly, let's say. And of course, an actor can create other actors, and you build up a hierarchy of actors that implement your application. So it's a concurrency and distribution uh, construct, uh, and each actor gets an address, uh, it's location transparent, and um, so uh, what is important for you if you program uh, an actor, if you develop a actor code, that is that uh, Inside your actor code, you can you have this single-threaded illusion. So it's as if you don't you don't really need to care about locking stuff, uh, concurrency in general. Okay, so it's 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 one of the most powerful uh, ways to implement concurrent applications. So here's a yes yeah, a small drawing of uh, 
of how a typical, typical uh, actor interaction uh, works. So these these uh, these uh, characters are are actually actors. And for example, there is an initial message that is sent to uh, an actor. So it has a mailbox that contains messages. It's a first in, first out. Uh, that actor may say, well, don't know really what to do with this, but I'll send it to a specialist uh, actor that may, may be able to take care of it. So the message is received. It's sent to maybe a set of workers, in a, uh, a basically a set of actors in, an act in a works worker pool. And um, one of them responds. And then the, uh, this actor, in turn, may send the response directly to the original requester. Okay? So this is a typical example how, of how things uh, flow. So that's a general introduction for ACA. And then we have ACA streams. So ACA streams are built on top of actor, actors in general. So ACA streams implements um, the, the reactive streams uh, protocols, right? And it um, has this type of model to build uh, a streaming application. So we distinguish uh, things, um, sources, flows, and sinks. So a source, obviously, it's a source of data elements. So it can be a stream of uh, a finite number of data elements. It can be a stream of an infinite, uh, never-ending stream of, of data elements. So here you see the, it's, con it's hooked up to a flow, and the flow is a general message uh, stream processor. Okay, so it can do transformations, it can perform side effects such as logging or whatever. Okay, and then uh, finally you have something which is called a sync, which is uh, taking in the result and performing some action on it. Maybe saving it, uh, all the data elements in a file, or sending it on a pipe, network pipe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can have a, we have the asynchronous boundaries. It says possible, and more about that in a, in a second. But the important point is that if you implement a streaming application with ACA streams, you, get, you automatically get the back pressure uh, for free, right? It's uh, your, uh, if, if the sync can't keep up or the flow can't keep up with the source, it will tell the source, hey, slow down, OK? So, Typically, if we don't have back pressure, what happens, for example, we have a, so a sync that is able to process one message per second, and um, a source that emits ten wants to emit 10 messages per second, well, two things can happen. Uh, when these messages arrive, the sync can say, well, overflow, I give up, and it just discards uh, the messages that it can't process. Alternatively, it buffers them, it has a, an unlimited, an unbounded buffer, maybe. But then what will happen, that is sooner or later, you will run out of memory, and your application is done, right? It's, it's cooked. So the way it works with back pressure is that uh, when, uh, before this can happen, this scenario, it's actually there's a back channel that communicates uh, back to the source uh, that it needs to slow down. And you, as a programmer, using of these APIs, don't need to think about uh, this, basically. So with ACA streams, you can build up quite complicated applications, quite complicated flows. So here's a kind of a generic example where we have two sources. We have two sinks. We have a number of flow components that process uh, the data elements. And uh, what you can see is that uh, you can not only implement linear streams, but you can actually have feedback in your system. So we have this flow that sends uh, data elements to this flow, which in turn sends, maybe combines these with, uh, from this source with the output of this flow, and then sends them to another flow. But you see that there is also a flow from, uh, of data between this flow and, and that flow. So you have actually feedback that you can use, and that we'll actually show an example of that in the demo. Now this is all uh, nice. Right? So this is it, this basically covers the basic principle of how you would develop application. But there's also uh, the element of materialization. 
and materialization is the following. So uh, if you build a flow like, like this, okay, what you're actually doing is, uh, programmatically, is building a blueprint. So you're actually um, adding stages like flows and sinks and sources together. And um, it's actually not doing anything yet. It's just telling the system this is how the data elements will be processed and combined, etc., etc. What actually happens uh, when you want to run it is that act, uh, the f in the first step uh, there is an optimization taking place. So it's actually not immediately, you could say, the blueprint that is going to run, but it's uh, a fused, what is called a fused version of it. So by default, if we go back to this drawing, normally you would expect here to be plenty of asynchronous boundaries, right? When the stream is fused, these boundaries are removed. So internal buffers are removed and the messages are directly passed from one stage to another. Okay? And some optimization can take place. So in principle, it's going to be faster than with having uh, the async boundaries uh, still there. But important is that the back pressure stuff still continues to work as seen from the, you know, the inputs and the outputs of your, uh, of your flow. And then uh, after fusing and optimizations, you can actually run the flow and, or the, the whole uh, fused system. And for that, you need kind of the engine, you know, the gears uh, that make the, the, the thing work. And that is called materialization. So you need a materializer, which in the end boils down to an actor and underlying a, uh, a, a, a thread of um, um, a pool thread, basically, a thread pool. And that's actually what gets executed when you run your program. If you want, you can still, uh, if you have a particular need for that, you can still introduce async boundaries at any of the, st uh, you know, in between stages at any point where you would uh, desire to do so, okay? All right, so let's have a look at a real application. So what I did is uh, I wrote a small uh, demo application which is uh, implementing an, an audio echo generator. And we'll use, uh, if, if anyone is familiar with uh, mathematics, uh, we use something which is called, or engineering, we use uh, components that are called finite and infinite uh, impulse response filters. Um, you don't need to run away, it's not, uh, we don't really, we'll be doing any, any sophisticated math, but that's the underlying principle. And while we're at it, uh, we'll not only generate echoes, but we'll also try to cancel them, okay? And for this demo, I'm, I'm using kind of the latest and greatest. Uh, I wrote the application in Scala. So we're using Scala 2.12.0, which also implies Java 8. And we use the latest uh, uh, version of ACA, which is ACA 2.4.12. Note, again, I really want to remind you of that, is that, uh, that I could have written this application in Java, right? So the library, the ACA streams APIs are also available in Java should you wish to program in Java. So, what is a, what is a finite impulse response filter? So that's the bit of the theory. So what do we have here? We have an input, which is a stream of audio samples. Uh, it's a digital signal. And you will see in the code that every sample is represented as a as a double okay so it's actually it's a bit of a waste but it's a 64 bit uh, floating point uh, number and we'll run it through this system that I will explain in a second and outcomes for every element coming in something comes out right and what now how does this work uh, how does this produce an echo well we built uh, we use delay elements, and a delay element will be a flow element in ACA streams that takes a double, and it will delay sending it to its output by some number of samples. For example, N1 here. So 
if I put in a like a pulse on the input, the pulse will come out here after n1 samples. Then we have another delay, another delay. So the signal in total appears at this point after n1 plus n2 plus n3 samples. And then at each state, stage, I take what comes out, I multiply ply it by some factor, which is a number smaller than one, and we add it together with the original input. And same thing here, same thing here. So you can probably understand now that if I put in a word like, a sound like blah, out comes blah, 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 blah. Okay, very, very, I think very in simple to understand. Of course, we see uh, a lot of repetition in here that will help us in implementing this. So we see delay element, uh, a multiplier, and an adder. Okay, uh, same thing here, same thing there. So we could say that we need an element that has two inputs and two outputs, and then we can just chain them together as many times as, you, as we want. So the basic building block is a it's something which we call a delay line. And the delay line, as said, has two inputs. It has two outputs. It has this multiplier, the adder, and some constant that we put in. So we need to uh, customize that by having uh, being able to create it with two parameters, the number of uh, the delay and the, and, the, and the attenuation factor. Okay? So let's implement such a, such a filter. For example, here we have uh, put in some real values, like at the first delay is 3,000 samples, this, the next one 1,500, the next one 4,500. And I, I, I chose negative constants. I could also have chosen positive constants, but it's here minus 0.3, uh, 0 0.3, minus 0 0.2, and minus 0 0.35. All right, so we'll skip to some coding now. And I'll also switch to, to the PDF, actually. All right, so here's my, here's my codes. And um, so initially, uh, I'll be able to blow, to make the window showing the code a bit larger in a second. But actually, I, I'm using a system that allows me to step through the different stages so I can uh, move to the, to the next step. And I get my, my code. And we'll build it up step by step. So what we'll start with, we have some supporting code here that uh, actually, is that readable? I guess it is. Yeah, but I want to skip back to the bottom part and uh, I always use the zoom in function. So if we, let's move this away. Okay, so that should be, that's bigger. Okay, so we want to implement uh, the delay line. So what I do is I, I uh, make a delay, delay line flow, which is, a, is an object and we have um, an apply method that I can ca pass in so it's kind of a, a factory method, okay? That can, that uh, we pass the delay and the scale factor, right? The two constants that we talked about. And I have two implementations. We will only use the top one, in fact, but there is an alternative implementation using a mutable queue uh, because we want the FIFO basically. And uh, we are using a mutable uh, mutable state, so. In fact, we have. Uh, I'm I'm using an array which is uh, as a length of the delay and is initially filled with zero, uh, zero double. And I keep a pointer basically that is in initially pointing to the first element of the array, and then every time a sample comes in, I uh, extract the sample from the e from the array using the index. I put in the new sample and I increment uh, the, the counter, basically, and uh, do that modulo the, the delay. So it's, it's like a pointer that is uh, er, uh, continuously running across the array. And then I create uh, the end result, which is basically, it needs to be of type iterable, 
and I have my delayed sample coming out on the top, let's say, and the calculated output, which is the previous output times the delayed sample times the scale factor, okay? So, if we take this, uh, we can write some tests. If I take a delay line spec, so this is uh, actually a test that verifies the proper uh, operation of this delay line flow. And uh, it's using Scala test uh, uh, 3, by the way, which allows for asynchronous testing. And so what I do is I first build a unit pulse, which is a source, remember, that starts with the uh, floating point number 1. And I add 10 values of 0. Okay, It's a finite flow. And then I write a test using free spec, basically that uh, says, um, okay, the delay, I have my delay line, and I build it up by taking the input pulse, and I map it by, uh, you know, uh, creating the sample n0, and run it via the delay line flow with 4 n0.5. And then I run it, so I, it basically gets materialized here, with a sync that converts it to a sequence. So out comes a future that contains this sequence of the result, okay? And then I can extract very easily, that don't do that in production, uh, in, in real code, this is in the testing, I extract the future value, and then I can say, um, okay, I have my, um, I extract, remember that I have two outputs now, the delayed signal and the delayed signal with the scaling. So I can say, okay, the delayed data should be uh, zero, and then the one shifted uh, five, uh, uh, one, two, three, four, huh? and the delayed and scaled data should be the same, but the scaling factor should be applied. Okay, so let's verify that. If we um, get our terminal window back and we run the tests, oh, sorry, they should. Oops, yeah, I can't zoom into this window, but anyway, you see that it's all green and that the test actually passed, okay? So, looking back here, what we've implemented is basically this building block, okay? Now, building our FIR filter should be sort of a piece of cake, so if we move to the next step, and we uh, look at our FIR filter uh, elements. So we have, uh, remember, the delay line flow. Oh, something I forgot to mention is that uh, you see the utilization of this flow stateful map concat. That's actually very crucial because we this actually is going to, you, you, we have mutable state and if we wouldn't do this construct, we would run into problem, problems if we run this component over multiple different materializers. Uh, they will actually, you will have an access, a concurrency problem uh, trying to access concurrent state, okay? So that wouldn't work. Uh, but I can have, have now some helper functions, like for example, uh, fir initial, which takes a double, a flow of doubles, and returns a two doubles as a tuple, okay? And what it does, it takes the input, and it, 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 which is the sample, which is a double, and it returns a tuple containing the two identical values. I have also a fir initial zero that does the same thing, but only passes the sample to the first output and systematically zero on the second output. And then I have a uh, fir select output, because in the end, uh, remember, I have, suppose I have my result, I still I have my output at the bottom, but at the top I have something that I want to discard, basically. And this is what fish select out does. It basically takes uh, a, a tuple of two doubles, uh, and it returns a double, and it does that, that by uh, taking the second element of the tuple and, and returning it on the output, okay? With all this in place, we can build our filter. So let's open the source for our filter. 
let's zoom in. So this is how it looks like. Okay, I can build my filter here at the bot at the top. So I say this uh, fir based echo is actually comprised of the sequencing of a number of stages. I can say I start with a fir initial initial. Remember which doubles out the the flow uh, the, the the samples, and then I pass it. I use this dot via. So I'm building my blueprint basically. I pass this uh, via a first delay line, delay line flow element with the appropriate parameters. Again, through the second flow, uh, delay line flow, the, the third delay line flow, and then I select my output. Okay. Um, I hard coded some WAV files in here. I use a small library that I, that I found on the internet. Uh, to be honest, I didn't take the effort to go and implement uh, something with the Java Media Framework which maybe some people will understand in the room. But anyway, so I, I use this welcome.wav file and I generate an output file. And then I need to have the, you know, the, the engine ready. That's these, these are these three lines. I need an, what is called an actor system on which the code will run. Uh, I'm using a dispatcher because I'm working with futures. And I need to create a materializer, which is done here. And then I can say, OK, let's run that flow. So I take a sound source, which I created from the welcome.wav, which is just generating a series of doubles. I run it through the FIR-based echo. This is not strictly necessary, so, but it shows you some functionality that you can use in the, flow libra in the streams library. I group all the samples in, of the elements by 1,000. And then uh, for each of them, I write frames using uh, this small library that I found to the output file. And then uh, because this run runs asynchronously, uh, I then uh, I get a future back. And what I do is I uh, wait for uh, the system to, to, to complete. Huh? And then I, sorry, I terminate the system. And then on complete, I close the output file. That's kind of the mechanics that will come back uh, uh, over and over again. So if we take this and we run it, that's done. And let's look at, uh, so we have to show you, this is our uh, input file. Welcome to the world of Java Sound. With the new Java Sound API. OK, you get the picture, I guess. Uh, if we uh, open the result, we get this. Welcome, Welcome to the Welcome world of Java, Java Sound. Sound. Java With the new With Java, Java Sound API, 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 you can control audio, audio playback audio audio or audio record audio new audio, audio, audio. audio. OK, so we have the two signals here um, that were processed. OK, let's continue. We talked about finite uh, impulse response filters, but there is also an infinite impulse response filter. And it looks uh, kind of uh, the same, but there is one huge difference. And the difference is that uh, you, you actually can see that this is an FIR filter, like shown here, right? And uh, its output here is actually sent back to the input and added. So what you will get as a, let's say, if I take the blah blah example, it will create uh, produce an infinite number of blah blahs in the output that, if my coefi coefficients are chosen right, will attenuate uh, over time. Okay, if you choose them wrongly, you have built uh, a f an oscillator, but that's another thing. So, uh, how do we implement it? Um, well, basically, uh, we've already got adders and multipliers. Okay, and uh, this is a joke, by the way. Um, and we need some extra tools like zippers and, and broadcast. So let's see how we can implement this. We already have a basic building block because we have the, 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 the implementation of the finite, imp uh, inf finite impulse response filter. So if we go to the next step. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, there is one intermediate step where, uh, I don't know if you want to go through that, uh, it's, it shows you the, 
yeah, the modularity with which you can implement things. Uh, so here uh, I start from a list of tuples that have the coefficients and the delays, right? And I map them to a filter stage, and a filter stage is just uh, a, a, a class that contains these values. And then I can say, uh, instead of stitching them together, I can say, build my FIR filter from these filter stages. And uh, what that means is that if we go to the filter elements, on, uh, this is the function that actually does this. So it's built FIR. I pass it a number of stages. I pass it an initial stage, which has some default value. I check some, I assert that certain conditions uh, on my input are correct. And then um, so I, I should at least have one stage, and each stage should, should have delays of at least one. Okay. And then I can, using folding, I can create my uh, core flow. So this is the chaining of the delay elements by folding the stages over an, init an initial stage. And you see that I take the what's already been built up and I add another delay line flow. And when that's done, I take my core flow and I, um, I add the selection of the right output in front. I put that in front of it. Okay, and I initialize uh, the initial is the is actually the splitter that duplicates the data. So I won't run this because it will produce obviously the same result, but it shows you that uh, now my application becomes uh, very very nice. I have just the specification of the stages, and I built the FIR filter from the stages. So if we now go to the next uh, step. we will see how we can implement the uh, IIR filter. And what we do is uh, we need to translate this in the world of ACA streams, okay? And this is how it l could be translated. Actually, this is not working, but I'll explain about that in a second. So we have um, our input, we have our output, we have our internal FIR filter, and I use a zipper. A zipper, what does it? It takes two streams, and if I have two elements on the input, it puts them together and it emits them on the output as a tuple of, of values. Then I have, a, I have to add these two together, remember? If I look at this diagram, this is the adder. And then I need to send the result to the output, but also to the input of the filter. So this is the broadcast function that is uh, needed. So for every input, it emits uh, the same value on the output. Uh, and you can have broadcast with as many values as you want in principle. And uh, then the output of the filter is fed back to the zipper. Now this one, if you implement it, it doesn't work. Actually, th theoretically, it's correct, but it won't emit any, any single data element. And the reason is, is that there is kind of a catch-22 uh, in here, uh, because the zip uh, will only produce something on its output when it has received something on, its, on both its inputs, right? Now, in order for... So, fine, we have an input signal, great, but we need to get a first data element on this input. And, of course, when there's nothing coming out, Nothing will be coming out of this either, and the fil fil fi uh, internal fit filter will not produce any data element, and we're, we have a, a kind of a deadlock. So how do we solve that? Well, we add some extra element, and that's the way it works. We have a concat stream uh, processing element and a Kickstarter. The Kickstarter is actually a source that emits a single double zero. What does the concat do? The concat, um, it first starts looking at its first input, so in zero, and it will emit to the output everything that is coming on in zero. So as long as there's data, it will continue to emit it. And uh, in this case, there's only one value, so that value will come out, and we have the zero that we want, okay? Because our, anyway, a real filter is initialized everywhere with zeros. Okay. 
So that, that gets actually the flow, that gives the kick, that gets the flow going. So with that zero, we are happy, we can, this uh, flows through, we get the feedback, and because this one is stopped automatically, because it's only a single element, we will now have the flow going like this, okay? Going to in one and cycling around. And that should work, okay? So how do we implement that? Let's look at the code. So we see now in our uh, in our uh, 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 code here of the filter elements, there is a we have a new function built IIR, okay, which uh, does some manipulation because I have to. Um, so we, I, I also built this IIR filter from a sequence of filter stages. But then the interesting thing is that we're using the graph DSL that is available in, um, in ACA streams. And how does this work? Well, I pass it, in this case, I've, uh, I have a, a factory method actually that I pass a, the fit filter, okay? And then I say, okay, I uh, create a flow from a, from a, from a flow graph. Um, I have this start element, remember, that is a source that emits a single double zero. I have the concat, and I add the concat to the, to the, to the graph, basically, by doing, this is the builder, the, the graph builder. So I say b.add and I add a concat uh, uh, that takes a double, okay? Then I have uh, a zipper. I needed a zipper, so I add a zipper that takes a, uh, a double, uh, that takes two doubles, sorry. And I have a broadcast function that uh, takes a double and has two outputs, okay? Here I can specify uh, how many to how many outputs I want to broadcast a result. And then I have the adder, and the adder is basically a flow that does the, that takes a tuple with an, an, uh, two elements in and feedback and adds the two together as a single double. So it takes in a tuple of doubles and it emits a double. And then, this is the cool part. Um, for clarity, there's some comment that is kind of implicit. Um, uh, and we can build up the flow. We can say start goes to concat, so that goes to the first. Uh, the that yeah, that goes to the first input of concat. We we have this DSL, the, uh, the domain specific language. So this is actually saying connect this start to the input of the concat, connect the output of the concat to the input of the first input of the zipper. Then he. This is actually a second statement. I could also put this on a separate line. Okay but it wasn't done for that because it actually belongs together. And then when we take the output of the zip, we pass it through the adder, and we, we send it as the imp to the input of the broadcaster. And then we take the second uh, input, um, it, it's actually, actually now the backflow, so you see the pointer, the arrows point in a different direction, they point uh, to, to the left. We take the output zero of the broadcast, we send it, to the input of our internal FIR filter, and then we send it to the first input of the concat. And then we're almost done. We can say, okay, we're going to create a flow shape, a shape that takes um, a double as input and a double as output, and the input is actually connected to the input zero of the zipper, and the output is coming from the broadcast, the output one, okay? And then we use this uh, IIR flow in the build IIR function to create our IIR uh, flow. If we do that, so we can, there's also, I didn't show the tests actually, but uh, I have some unit tests to verify that on a, on a very simple uh, uh, sample. But if we run this, so if we run this, we will have a new, okay, I need to select which one I want to run, so I do the R, I, I, R, and if we listen to the result, we now get this. Welcome to the world of Java Sound.
With the new Java Sound API, you can control audio playback or record new audio content. This file was created using Java Sound. So you may not be able to tell the much of a difference, but it's actually containing lots more, uh, lots and lots more echoes. And then uh, let's see, we have only ten minutes left. Um, you could say now. How could we do the echo, can echo cancellation part, right? And a naive way to do it is say, well, if I chain two FIR filters together and I sw swap around the coefficients, uh, well, swap around, I, I change the sign, I do some elimination, right? Unfortunately, that doesn't work. Uh, why doesn't that work? Well, if we go to the next step. And... Uh, can actually, I think I wrote a test for that. Yeah. So if we if we look at this, if we look at this, um, we have two filters, and one of them con it's very simple. It's only a one stage delay of two uh, attenuation factor minus zero three. And the second one is the same delay and plus zero three, okay? And we run a unit pulse again through the two filters in, sta in sequence. Uh, we convert it to a sequence, extract the value. And now if we un uncomment this, and this is just to show you the result instead of writing a main program. So I, I, I check if the, if the fit response is just a one with five zeros appended to it. If I run this as a test, It will fail, and let me see if we go and let's open it in Sublime, maybe. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's not much bigger. You see that the indeed, so the, the unit pulse comes out, but it should put, uh, you see that actually uh, originally there was, there would be minus 0 0.5. That's it eliminated, so there's the first echo is eliminated, but you see that there is minus 0 0.009. Draw this on a piece of paper and you will understand why. But the cool thing is that, um, and I just want to show you the result. Now we can ask, uh, have some questions and some, some closing out. So if I go to the next step, the solution to uh, create, to, to eliminate the echo is, uh, is here. <coughs> so what we do is we start with an FIR filter. We built it, we have it here. Then we use an IIR filter, but we invert, I map it, oh, I take the filter stages basically, and I invert the, the sign of the coefficients. And I build an IIR filter based on that. And then I run my uh, IIR filter, my, my, my sound through the IIR filter, and then through the FIR filter. And let me first show you that it actually works. So I just do it first through the IIR filter, if I uh, run this program, so if I run it, I should get the echoes back. Uh, for so let's listen. Welcome to the world of Java. Okay, that's uh, to be expected. Now, if I put back the the chaining of the two filters, and I run it. Welcome to the world of Java Sound. With the and I have my original signal. So that's, uh, that's the demo part. Um, one thing to point out, did we demonstrate back pressure with this, uh, with this uh, code? Well, we actually didn't, unfortunately. Okay, But uh, if I would hook up the, what I wrote, I would have a, a, a sync, basically, that interfaces to an audio stream in like a JMF, I would be actually the flow of the data 
would be completely controlled by the rate at which the audio stream is consumed in the audio framework. Okay? Um, and that's basically uh, my talk. Let's see if there's a slide wise, if there's anything left. Yeah, maybe some further information. Um, so a lot of uh, pointers to interesting websites, of course, the ACA documentation, um, the Reactive Streams organization. There's this, uh, I can recommend it, uh, this book by my colleague uh, Konrad uh, Malawski, who is on the ACA core developer on the ACA team. You can get it for free. And then, uh, yeah, get involved, right? There's a uh, Gitter channels for ACA, mailing lists. Uh, you can get to the sources. And here's also my mail address if you want to send me questions or remarks. And that brings up, us up to the questions. And we have like four minutes left. If anyone would like to ask a question, please feel free to do so. On the part where you? Where we had to use some special data structure because of specialization issues. Ah, okay, yeah. You mean... Uh, you mean this part, right? This part. It bas basically, what it does is that for each materializer, if you have, it will create an instance of uh, of this. Okay, so it has its own private state, and it will not inter interfere with uh, with other materializations. Okay, that's the that's the short story. You should read uh, probably in the documentation about it in more detail. Yes. Yeah, of course, but I mean, we only have an hour. So the question was, this is all on static files. Can we do this on live streams? Well, if I could do the demo where I generate the echoes uh, from a microphone, but I hope you understand that th this probably would not be a very good idea, OK? Um, we, because you're, it would be bad for your ears. But um, would it be, would it be fast yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it is extremely fast because of on, uh, for example, the things that, that take place like, like the fusion, okay? So it's basically building one big uh, functional transformation of, 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 your, of your data, okay? I haven't characterized uh, this in terms of performance. And by the way, I intend to also make this uh, sample code. It's not really a useful application, but it's fun to play with, uh, as you can imagine, uh, on, on uh, GitHub, okay? Any other questions? We have two minutes left. Um, I see you use here a mutable state here, and I'm a Scala developer for five years now, so far so it's a oh, yeah, yeah. bit of a okay. feeling. Uh, did you try for speed? I'm, I'm not sure, but I think you can, uh, you can manage to rewrite this without using it. Yeah, so the question is, I see you using sh um, mutable state. Should you do that? Because, uh, to be honest, the, the person who asked the question is, is a Scala developer and says it's kind of uh, against the, it rubs against the, how do I say, the hairs, <laughs> something like that. So uh, you're, you're right in part, but if you look at, uh, in, in essence, there's nothing wrong with using mutable state, uh, provided that you know what you're doing and that you shield it from the outside world. Sometimes it's necessary for performance reasons, okay? Uh, and you're right. Two, that you could implement this using purely immutable, uh, an immutable implementation, okay? That's perfectly fine. But this one is uh, most likely, the one that I shown, showed is probably the most uh, performant. Okay, time is up, I see. So uh, thanks very much for uh, your attendance. And uh, as I said, if you have any questions, come and see me.